that felt that the presence of Muslims made them somewhat or very worried about security. And a poll in 2012 showed that 52% of Canadians distrust Muslims and believe that any discrimination against Muslims is basically their own fault. Now there's also policies, security policies um, that we have in Canada, things like Bill 21, which we'll hear about in some of the later presentations, which I refer to as a form of sartorial nationalism and racial secularism, where those come together. So Muslim women's bodies uh, who are dressed in religious attire are being regulated and disciplined within the public sphere and cannot hold posts within civil um, services. So teachers, lawyers, police officer, any kind of civil uh, employment if they're wearing a niqab or um, headscarf, so any ostentatious religious symbols, although the cross in the Quebec legislature was only removed in 2019. Um, so we have also security policy. Someone talked about, uh, Hakim was talking about the no-fly list here in the U.S. In Canada, we have Muslim children's names and toddlers on that no-fly list as well. We have racial profiling, you know, security certificates where non-citizens can be held indefinitely with secret trials and secret evidence against them. We've had the Canada Revenue Agency um, monitoring and surveilling Muslim charities. So those are some of the security industry and its um, securitization of Muslims. We also have an Islamophobia industry that is networked, organized, and monetizes Islamophobia campaigns. But I guess aside from that, we don't have Islamophobia in Canada. So to further that point of the different ways and nuances of Islamophobia, how it's manifest in Canada, we have a stellar panel here uh, of many of my colleagues and friends from Canada who have been doing uh, wonderful work on this topic. And some of these papers were in the fall, last fall's issue of the Islamophobia Studies Journal on Islamophobia in the Great White North. And um, so I'm very happy to be able to introduce them. And I think what I, I think I will introduce each person and then they can come up um, afterwards. So I'll just introduce the whole panel. And the first speaker is going to be Dr. Yasmin Jawani, who's from Concordia University. And then we have Dr. Eve Huck from York University and uh, Dr. Navid Bakali from University of Windsor and Hasina Alizai, who is a PhD candidate at Queen's University. And so we've got an interdisciplinary panel who are going to be looking at Islamophobia from the perspective of uh, social media, from the perspective of education, cultural studies. So it will give us a, a very rich and robust understanding of some very specific kinds of issues and some empirical um, research that um, in, better informs us about the manifestations of Islamophobia in Canada. So we will have the, pan the panel present and then we will have time for Q&A um, after that. So uh, without further ado, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Yasmin Giovanni uh, from Concordia University. Please welcome. Thank you so much, uh, and thank you to the organizers, and especially Jasmine for allowing me to be here or encouraging me to be here um, and inviting me. And I've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to really speed. Okay. So I want to start out by saying that this, that my presentation is actually about the resistance to Islamophobia. And it's a resistance that's grounded in ritual, in a way. It's a resistance grounded in remembrance. And in bringing up this, I also want to sort of like begin this presentation by remembering all the victims of Islamophobia across and around the world. And I'm thinking particularly in terms of this recognition, the impending recognition of the Nakma in, uh, on May 15th. And I think we should be really mindful of the, the kinds of sort of victimizations, but also the crimes, the murders of Muslim bodies and how these are themselves sort of absented from public discourse. So I want to start out with that remembrance in mind, because we, we begin with an acknowledgement of indigenous lands that we're on. We begin with an acknowledgement of the history and legacy of slavery and indentured labor. And I think one of the things that we need to be mindful of is of the bodies that are never considered grievable, 
and that are not openly acknowledged as grievable. So I want to start out with that. And um, let's see if I can go to the next slide here. So this particular work was informed by two, two high-profile uh, murders. One, as, as uh, Jasmine Zinn has already mentioned, the, uh, the victims of the Quebec mosque shooting. And the second one, the victims, the Afzal Salman family that was murdered um, in, a, in a really weird, uh, deliberate way where a truck basically ran into them, killing four out of the five of the family. So I was looking particularly at these digital artifacts. How, in fact, are these artifacts positioned? What did they say in terms of resistance? How do they mobilize a kind of resistance against the erasure of memory, against forgetting? So these are the two high-profile tragedies that I'm focusing on. And I want you to pay particular attention to the pictures because it's the images that in the, in the way that they were reworked kind of became condensed symbols of mourning that also were used to invoke and incite not only solidarity, but a form of protest, right? Saying, listen, this has happened. You can't just cover it up. So, Again, to come back to the notion of resistance, I want to go back to Pierre Nora's work, which is to claim the right to memory is at bottom a call for justice. So when Jasmine talks about the Great White North, this is a myth that is Canada. And it's something that I've talked about in terms of my work on the discourses of denial that are really fundamental to sort of the Canadian psyche and Canadian politics, which is it just doesn't exist here. So against the erasure and state-sanctioned amnesia, this form of resistance through memory, through keeping alive memory, becomes really powerful. The second thing is against the episodic coverage. Because in the news media, one of the things that happens is a kind of sort of focus on the single story, the episode the episodic coverage, as opposed to a systemic realization. So you never really see the layered history of it or how many other events and incidents like this have happened. And the third thing is that this kind of sort of memory work, it's forming memory communities. In a, and in that way, it's sustaining a, a cultural and collective memory of who we are, where we've come from, what we've gone through, et cetera. So it's that kind of resisting through uh, forgetting, through naming and shaming. And finally, it, it is a form of political mobilization. And we can see that even in terms of the naming of the Nakma or the recognition of it. So I want to you know, emphasize that remembering is a political act. So January 29, 2017, when a gun gunman strode into the Quebec mosque, uh, Quebec mosque and shot six people and uh, injured 14 others, one of the first things that happened is what's called spontaneous memorials that began to appear in the site immediately around. So these spontaneous memorials were there to say, listen, this happened. And we've seen this even in terms of the ghost bicycles and many other things where you see a memorial on the roadside saying this accident happened, this tragedy happened. And it's that kind of sort of fixing in a place that you can't walk away from it or you can't just bypass it. You're constantly reminded of it. So this was one of the things that happened right away. Oh, let's go here. So what were the precursors to that? And that's something that we've written about, many of us have already written about, but I want to bring it back to the Quebec um, situation because particularly since most recently, the, the lone um, uh, official that's actually been recognized as being sort of like, um, uh, She's not in exactly the ambassador, but she is in that position of bringing recognition to the existence of Islamophobia, uh, has been attacked for, for uh, saying that Quebec is more racist. But both these incidents, or this one particular incident, happened in Quebec. So what were the precursors to that? Well, one was the de facto and de jure Islamophobia. That's there. 
the second thing is the popular talk shows because in Quebec and particularly Quebec City is a car city. Okay, everybody drives around. And one of the biggest things there is what's called trash radio. They're so big and so influential that practically all the politicians, you know, beg to be on it. The third thing is incidents, the previous incidents that had already happened. The fourth is the state sanctioned violence, Bill 21, which Jasmine Zinn has already mentioned structural violence and the daily acts of Islamophobia. So all of this was sort of like happening before. Then the tragedy happened. And immediately after, you saw the spontaneous memorials occurring across the country, but particularly in Quebec City. So my focus became on the hashtag, these, partic these four hashtags to see how, in fact, was this event memorialized and how were these memories then harnessed to push for political change? So the methodology I employed is something called thin description as opposed to Clifford Geertz's thick description, which some of you may already know about. And I'm not really going to go into this so much because it's already there in the article. But all of this to say, that a lot of the digital work that's there, that you know, the archaeology of these kind of digital platforms really benefits from this kind of thin methodology. Because you can't really, to go and lurk in these areas is not exactly ethical. But at the same time, to interview people who are going through that kind of grief is not very ethical either. Because it does bring up all kinds of other things. So the thin description really works. So why look at these digital artifacts of mourning? Well, it's not just that they condense, but it's also because they have afterlives. They persist after the event. So in that sense, there's a doubling effect there. They not only keep the memory alive, but they persist over time. And because they are artifacts, they can be imputed with different meanings that that are resonant with the current situation. And this is what we're going to see is how they are not only able to capture that, but also that they accumulate micro histories through a kind of late layering and a call and response uh, format. The other thing is that they are sort of like, they define the emotional and ideological landscape of the space. And finally, they have this kind of mobility that goes across platforms. That's what makes them so powerful. So I want to go back to what happened in New Zealand after the Christchurch shooting. One of the first digital artifacts that sort of like came immediately after was this one, which you see the character saying, hello, brother. This was what, in fact, the victim, the first victim who opened the door to, to the shooter said, hello, brother. And it became a really powerful way in which to communicate how the openness of someone had resulted in this kind of sort of total, a total onslaught of violence. This opening, this hello, brother, in the name of Islam, basically invited this guy to come in and shoot everybody because there was no other sort of notion that something like this could actually happen. But it was so powerful because it's emotionally laden. You know, it makes you feel something. And it's those networks and nodes of affective connectivity that in fact this digital artifact was able to sort of travel through, but also incite and solicit. So I went to the hashtags in looking at the Canadian examples, and these were the four that I particularly focused on. So one of the first ones was the Remember January 29th, but immediately in the aftermath of this, a year, or sort of a year later, there was an image that had, was created by two artists, Melissa Watson and uh, Cyrus Marcus Ware, with the Council of Canadians. And this was the image that they came up with. 
So it's a silhouetted kind of image. You can see the outlines and you can totally identify who the victims were. And I think that's important because against the backdrop or the sort of canvas of Islamophobia where all Muslims are the same and all Muslims have no humanity or individuality, this becomes a way of identifying the victims and showing the differences within that, that Muslims are not a monolith and Islam is not monolithic. So this particular image actually was introduced and then a, a miniaturized version of it appeared in a, a digital sort of newsletter. And once it appeared, it became easy to transport the, the size of it. It sort of enhanced the mobility and it went across these nodes. So much so that it now became something that reappears over and over again so that we don't forget. We don't forget these victims. The second thing was this particular site, Do You Remember January 29th, which was created by two students at McGill University. And it was really powerful, not only in terms of capturing testimonies, but making one remember over and over again that this isn't some sort of like just neutral date, like January 30th. There's a significance to that. So the hashtag became, in fact, as um, Jonathan Rosa has written so nicely about, a, a catch-all way in which to sort of trap and co uh, create a collage of everything associated with this event. Then the Green Square campaign, which came much later, which was again introduced by the National Council of Canadian Muslims, and which also became a way in which, you know, the green tag, which re reminds one of Islam, is the color of Islam, then gets used with all kinds of things imported on it. So here's the green square, which first began as it's a plain green square. Then at every anniversary of the Quebec mosque shooting, it had something written on it. Then when the London... Uh, tragedy happened. The London tragedy was something that was written on it. So again, a kind of portable digital artifact that can travel across platforms and that basically becomes a way to mediate through all of these different ways, you know, a kind of remembrance. So here you see that the app the particular sort of like features of these digital artifacts, that they allow for a kind of remediation, that they are combat combinative, that there's a replicability, and that they are cumulative. So here, you, on the left, you can see, in fact, how that particular image that first came out is then replicated every year. And, and this is sort of like the Twitter screenshots of every single year after, you know, that basically shows you how it's traveling and how it's layering a history. So the next one that I wanted to go to, and I, I don't have much time. I have one minute left, according to Zainab. So who also, by the, by the way, created this Our London Family Cloud, which shows you, in fact, how that particular hashtag became a way to carry all of these kinds of images. But here you see the image of the family, and then you see the way in which a digital artifact brings up different kinds of questions. So I can't help but think that this could have been my family, became one way in which that grief became mobilized. The second thing is the reminders of the echoes of the past. And here you see the silhouetted silhouette of the family against all the people that basically uh, protest or like wrote against the recognition of, of an official day of remember of recognizing Islamophobia. So there's a history that becomes alive there. Then you see, in fact, how an artist, Inquisitive, basically created an image of the lone survivor of this family, you know, with his, hash, uh, his message there in solidarity. And then the same message gets used for a Twitter storm across different platforms. The same thing happens with the green square, but also in terms of the silhouette of the family, where again, it becomes the digital artifact paired with a, a message and then pushed through. 
So I want to conclude by saying that these artifacts are really powerful because contrary to the kind of thing that we think, well, okay, social media is really sort of short term, it's temporary, it's transient, it's not going to really reflect on anything and something comes and goes, that in fact, these digital artifacts actually keep that history alive and work in resistance against the kind of systemic amnesia that is being propagated by the state. So I'll end there and thank you very much. Not mine either. <laughs> the tab is not visible. No. So we're gonna. Well, this is all stuff, guys. Uh, girl. Whoa, what happened to our crew? Maybe it's here. Girl. You guys closed it. Why'd you close it? You didn't do anything. It's her fault. <laughs> okay, no worries. It's here. So I'm going to open the tabs back up, okay? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yasmin. That was really a great paper. I want to thank everybody, all the organizers, the audience for being here, and of course, Jasmine for organizing first the issue that some of us are in, and we're speaking about the papers and those issues, and also for organizing this panel. Thank you, Jasmine. Um, I also want to um, just say, the paper is really long in the journal, <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to walk you through all the details. I'll rush you through some of it, though, so bear with me. Um, I, I, and I want to talk, you know, Jasmine talked about the fact that memory is political and important, and this paper is about a memorial for Aksa Parvez. And it's very political in the strangest ways, not necessarily in this resistance way, but in a way to confirm the sort of national white fantasy that is multicultural, you know, white settler Canada that Jasmine uh, talked about earlier when she introduced the panel. Some of you may know about Aksa Parvez, but just in case, uh, let me just tell you very quickly that in late 2007, she was a 16-year-old Canadian high school student in the suburbs of uh, Greater Toronto area. She was murdered by her brother, uh, who was a tow truck driver, and her father, uh, Mohammed, who was a refugee, came from Pakistan, and who worked as a taxi driver. She was the youngest of eight children, and they all lived together in a multi-generational extended family household. This is a very common kind of story for um, families, Muslim families, who are living often in multi-generational homes in poverty and try and piece their lives together. So I came to this topic by first encountering this shocking, sensationalist kind of uh, Toronto Star article 
um, the day after her death. And I watched as the story continued to grow. The media coverage became international, it was highly sensationalized, and I wrote about this back in 2010. A uh, song, a uh, CD, was also written about this, her murder. Um, a documentary by Shelley Sewa, which I saw at Hot Docs. It won an audience participation or audience award, favorite award. Um, and I'm so shocked and horrified by this documentary. I also wrote about that. This, and then this paper comes because on the anniversary of her death in 2008, there was an article in the Toronto Sun um, which spoke about her, her uh, grave site. And this article basically talks about the fact that um, she was buried here, and I'm quoting from uh, the article in the Toronto Sun, Section 17, plot number 774 in the Meadowville Cemetery in Brampton, which is close to where she lived and died and went to high school. To be precise, no name, no date, no birth, no date of death, no nothing. But resting here is a girl who dared to be Canadian, end quote. Okay, so you write an article like that and you write in the Toronto Sun, you have a readership, a big readership, and um, some, you know, someone's going to read it. The whole point is to generate a public feeling around this. And Scott McLeod, who at the time was, and still is, I suppose, the Pelham Fire Chief and his fellow firefighter, Norm Traversy. And Pelham is a small town in the Niagara region. If you look, uh, okay, I have no pointer, but Toronto is at the top of the lake. And Niagara is down there at the bottom, near the border, just north of Buffalo. So really far away, Niagara region is a beautiful bucolic uh, kind of uh, tourist area, wine country. And so you're wondering, what is the relationship between Aksa, who lived in the suburb, Brampton, Mississauga, and Pelham? She'd never been there or anything. Well, this is what I want to trace and talk to you about today. But how is it that these memory practices also circulate through the creation of public feelings? And how that in turn then confirms the sort of white settler national fantasy of multicultural Canada. Okay, so Norm and Scott, these are the two firefighters, they read this article and they're outraged. And of course, it's written also to provoke this kind of outrage. And so they just said, we got to get a headstone for this young woman. We don't know, right? Uh, they are regular readers of Pam Geller's at the time called Atlas Shrugs blog. Um, and uh, you may know Pam Geller, some of you, especially if you uh, follow hate speech and hate mongering. Um, and she's friends with Robert Spencer, who runs Jihad Watch, and they co-founded the American Freedom Defense Initiative. It, these people need to be taken very seriously. Um, the Southern Poverty Law Center has deemed them hate mongers and Islamophobes and people to watch. So, Mom Traversy, Scott McLeod, they're regular readers of Atlas Shrugs, and they go to Gala and they say, hey, look at this outrage, yet another barbaric cultural practice. So Pam goes, I'm going to put this out on my blog, and I'm going to get my buddy Robert Spencer to put it out on his blog, She had Watch, and a little over a year, they raised $5,000. So what are they going to do with this $5,000? They decide we're going to approach the cemetery where this young woman, her family has buried her, and we're going to say, we're going to put a tombstone here, and we're going to put a bench, and we're going to plant some trees. The cemetery contacts the family, and the family's like, no, we don't know who this is, we don't want that. You know, and none of this, you know, takes into account different kinds of memorial practices, in cemetery, you know, in terms of burials that Muslims may have. This is just no headstone equals barbaric erasure of this young woman and her life and death. So, um, you know, they come up with, you know, this is no kind of joke. They actually come up with a model of a headstone that they send to the cemetery. So since the cemetery says no, then they approach the University of Guelph. The University of Guelph has a program where they um, have a memorial 
garden where anybody can buy a bench, plant a grove of trees. So they approach uh, University of Guelph, who initially says yes. Then somebody must have Googled Pam Geller, and they, because she's the one making all the outreach and communications, and they realize, oh, okay, wait a minute, this is not going to be good. So then they also rescind the offer that um, for the establishment of a memorial and access name. So finally, Scott McLeod approaches the counselor in his small town of Pelham, um, and he, she, Sharon Cook, and says, look, can we just do it here in the town square? And she says, sure, that's a great idea. So they, they come up with this plan, and know if you can see, there's going to be a burning bush, uh, there's going to be these weeping cypress, um, and this is all going to be on the edge of the town square, and that's the memorial bench. These sort of biblical references are not accidental. Um, so after a year, finally, they create the bench, and the bench is unveiled at the foot of the bench as they're erecting it. They bury a scroll with the names of all the international donors through Pam Geller's Atlas Shrugs blog. So those names are buried at the foot of this bench. And there's this big memorial ceremony. Somebody reads a poem. I won't go into it because of time, but there's a lot of talk about crystal palace and angels and things like that. A lot of Christian um, symbolism is part of the ceremony. OK, so I thought, you know what? i got to go see this. So drove down. You see this? We shall walk into the crystal mountain, lifting on shoulder of angels, et cetera, et cetera. And the, this is the bench. Took a picture of the bench, and it's called Remembering New Canadians Lost to the Quest of Integrating Cultures. Aksaparga is remembered and free. This is the Peace Park it's located in, and this is what it looks over, the beer store, the parking lot of the beer store. So you can see in some ways what the intentionality is here. Uh, around the erection. And of course, in the middle of the town square are what is in the middle of most town squares, these war memorials, right? And so this is the war memorial in the middle of the town square. Sorry, let me just scroll. Okay, I don't know how I'm doing for time, but let me then, so I, I just want to talk a little bit about, you know, what does it mean to have a memorial so far away from where someone lived and died? Um, and, you know, what kind of work does that do? What kind of memory work does that do in the service of particular national ideal? of the perfect subject of the nation, right? I mean, this story of the establishment of the memorial for AXA in Pelham emerges in the kind of post 9-11 uh, era of stories across small towns in Canada and their engagements with immigrants, multiculturalism, and in particular, Islamophobic exclusion. Among these is the example of the Statement of Values for Immigrants published by the municipal government of Gatineau, Quebec, in 2011, there are 16 guidelines for newcomers to Gatineau, including injunctions to not willfully starve their children, not to use spices that cause body odor and smells to emanate from their homes, as well as warnings that men and women have equal rights and physical and sexual violence is wrong. This statement of values is reminiscent of the more infamous Aruville Quebec Code of Conduct from a few years before that, which include injunctions against FGM, stoning of women, and covering one's face, as well as against prayer in school, which is ironic because, of course, Canada, I, you know, I went to school, elementary school in Canada, we had daily Christian prayer. So this is a very complicated journey to establish a memorial for Axel, but it exemplifies white seller anxieties about encroaching barbaric culture of Muslim other, the need to fortify real small town Canadian values. Elizabeth Furness talks about the importance of the frontier myth in the construction of Canadian nationhood and the formation of small town identities with Canadian frontier myths sort of distinguished from American frontier narratives because there's a sort of construction of a Euro-Canadian identity as one of benevolent paternalism. 
This belief in the benevolence and niceness of Canadian towns is sort of captured in Palin's motto, which is small town with a big heart. This benevolence has come to frame these contemporary assertions of the Canadian national identity as iconic niceness and benevolence as sort of multicultural tolerance and distinguishes it then from this American melting pot um, society. This is very important national identity work very close Niagara remember it's right by Buffalo. Um, so it's very important sort of identity work to distinguish us from Americans. So this is a kind of myth of the moral superiority of the small town. It's widespread and continues to shape public constructions of small town and identity in very powerful ways. And you see this in Councillor Cook and her reassertion of Pelham as a small town with a big heart in a multicultural region and big enough in its heart to include this memorial to Axa Parvez. What better place than, than Pelham then to recognize her and redeem her from her death in the, from the barbarity of her religion? To finalize the completion of her journey of integration into a secular white settler, national fantasy of multiculturalism. Drawing on Michel Wolf trios, I want to argue that what needs to be denounced in this disturbing and extended story of AXA's memorialization is first the murder of AXA, but also the racist present within which representations of her and other Muslim women's murders as honor killings are produced, as well as the ongoing racism these representations sustain. In addition, these representations are always in the shadow of the sovereign subjectivity of the white settler, right? Um, these representations, even as memorials, lose their relationship to a living present. Then the focus on the past diverts us from present injustices for which the past only set the foundations. And I'm quoting Trudeau well there. He also warns us that the legacy of past horrors, in this case femicide, is exceptionally visibilized only because of the renewal of Islamophobia and gendered anti-Muslim racism, which repeats in the present. Thus, this particular secular multicultural formation of Axis Memorial removes from view the continuing and myriad exclusions of racism, the racialization of poverty, and understanding of femicide as a lethal harm that continues to affect not just Muslim women, but all Canadian women, as well as the ongoing settler colonial dispossession of indigenous people as a larger context from which these violences occur. So let me just finish. Um, I also went back to um, Meadowville Cemetery uh, a couple of years ago, and I took a picture. Her family had finally saved enough money to put in a memorial marker on her grave, and it says, in loving memory of Axa Parvez, always loved, always remembered. Thank you.
countries. So initially, you know, this this perception of outsiders is is where this threat is seen in terms of the right national imaginary. Then eventually, as the demographics begin to change through the change in immigration policy within Canada, this threat perception uh, that, you know, of what's threatening whiteness in Canada uh, shifts from outside to inwards. Uh, as the demographics of Canadian society begin to change, you have a number of policies and legislations which are aimed at preserving whiteness uh, and, and, and punishing otherness within Canadian society. And this is also reflected in educational spaces within Canada. Uh, the most egregious example of this within school spaces in Canada is the creation of residential schools. This was an institution that lasted in Canada for over 100 years, where indigenous populations were, uh, you know, the remaining indigenous populations were uh, totally, you know, devastated through this institution, where they were plucking away children from their families uh, in, in a process of re-education, uh, essentially engaging in cultural genocide of this of this uh, of, of these of these peoples, uh, which has led to the deaths of thousands of, of indigenous children, as well as uh, has caused the sort of multi generational trauma to this uh, to these communities. So as the demographics of Canada begin to change, there needs to be integration models that are put forward uh, in Canadian society. So at a federal level, we've, uh, since the 1970s, they've adopted this sort of multicultural framework for integrating, uh, for integrating diverse populations. Um, you know, this idea of multiculturalism in Canada is this notion that diversity is something that enriches society. It's something that uh, is welcome in, in Canadian society that enriches this mosaic. Now, a number of scholars, including including Eve Huck, who's been in a voice in this, have been very critical of sort of that idea, myself included. Uh, you know, where, you know, we would argue that this idea of multiculturalism being promoted kind of masks that sort of history of genocide. Uh, as well as that, that racist history of white settler colonialism, but also kind of masks the systemic racism that still exists within Canadian society. Nonetheless, Canada promotes this model as as an integration model within within the society. Uh, Quebec, however, is a bit different. Quebec is a French part of Canada, and the integration model in Quebec is interculturalism. Interculturalism puts forward the notion of a moral contract uh, between newcomers and Quebec society, placing the majority in culture at the forefront. So really unapologetically, uh, interculturalism is really just this promotion of French white supremacy. Uh, really, really uh, obviously in terms of ways promoting this idea that you know French white culture uh, the traditional culture in Quebec is, you know, at the forefront, and newcomers are kind of obliged to assimilate to that as as uh, the most critical and important sort of identity to have in that space. We say even interculturalism was really an outgrowth of the Quiet Revolution, which was a, which was a period in Quebec society uh, where sort of norms and identity were shifting in Quebec. So prior to the 1960s, uh, Quebec society was really very much dominated by English Canada. Uh, those that occupied positions of power in, Canada, in, in Quebec were English Canadians, whereas the majority of Quebec society were, were French Canadians. And so there was this movement in the 1960s called the Quiet Revolution, where there was a push towards, uh, you know, re reclaiming that space for the majority. Uh, the, the, the mantra was maître, uh, maître chez nous, the masters of our own home. And so we were promoting this idea of taking back power within, within Quebec society. And so in doing that, they totally shifted the, the sort of national identity of Quebec, whereas traditional Quebec culture was really very much centered around Catholicism and that religious identity. This uh, phase in the, the Quiet Revolution really pushed push towards a secular identity because Catholicism was seen as sort of something uh, preventing progress uh, amongst that community. So there was a, a strong shift towards a secular identity that was very much grounded in French language nationalism uh, from that point onwards. Uh, and so the secularization of Quebec society led to had educational implications as well. But in the 1980s or 1990s, around that time, uh, school boards became shifted away from confessional school boards, uh, which were based on Catholic and Protestant school boards, and shifted towards uh, secular school boards that were defined along language lines, so English and, and French school boards. Now, one would assume that uh, having secular school boards it makes more sense in a pluralistic society, right? You don't, you know, given that there's multiple religions in the society, you don't want to have a confessional system. However, French secularism is a bit unique to com you know, compared to how I think most Canadians envision secularism and how most of the world envisions secularism. Secularism is sort of this, uh, this distinction that the state does not promote a specific religion, whereas uh, French secularism or the ACT promotes this idea that 
uh, religion must be eliminated from the public sphere altogether. And you'll learn, probably we'll learn more about this tomorrow in the panel that looks at uh, Quebec and French society. So the ACT was, is what was promoted, and so this has had, has had educational implications as well. Essentially, in the educational spaces in, uh, in Quebec, this has led to the extermination of any traces of religion in publicly funded schools. So more recently, you have, as was mentioned earlier, the passing of Bill 21, which, uh, you know, in addition to other spaces in public institutions in, in, in Quebec, uh, specifically educational institutions, uh, you know, people working in those spaces are not allowed to wear religious symbols. Now, the law Bill 21 was, was stated in neutral terms. However, in practice, uh, Muslim women have been the most affected by this law. Uh, more recently, uh, just this past month, the Quebec Minister of Education is working now towards eliminating prayer spaces in schools altogether. Uh, now, prayer spaces in Quebec public schools have existed for about 30 years. Uh, I went to the public school system in Quebec. You know, I, I, the school I went to had a prayer space. This has been a non-issue for most of Quebec society for 30 years. However, uh, you know, as you know, for those of you that are aware of Quebec society and you know, and politics in general, when when a political party's incompetence is exposed they need to create defections. And so in Quebec society, there's a crumbling education system, a crumbling healthcare system. Recently, there's been severe weather conditions and the, you know, the, the energy grid can, couldn't manage it. So they're kind of seen as completely incompetent in managing the society. There needs to be deflection to kind of divert society's attention away from those problems and, and demonstrate how these parties are protecting the interests of the majority still. And so now they're using, you know, they have been using, uh, you know, religious minorities like Muslims as a punching bag uh, in terms of their civil rights and, and liberties uh, to be able to, to deflect attention away from their own incompetence. So look, that was looking at Quebec and Canadian society, but looking more specifically at curriculum within Canada, uh, you know, curriculum theorists as well as critical race educational theorists have t talked about this idea of master scripting in, in curriculum. So master, master scripting essentially is a way of promoting a dominant, nar dominant narrative to promote and to, to kind of preserve power dynamics within a society. So Canada, Canadian curriculum is not, uh, you know, uh, very much promotes a master script, uh, you know, in terms of how racism is discussed as more of a kind of an aberration, exceptional, exceptional uh, condition, as opposed to being systemic in nature. Specifically, if we look at the Quebec context, if we look at the master scripts in the curriculum there, uh, since the 1980s and 1990s, Muslims in textbooks in, in, in Quebec uh, education spaces were replete with anti-Muslim bias and prejudice. More recent studies of, of, of these textbooks have revealed that you know, some progress has been made. Uh, Muslims are not as stereotypically depicted. However, we still have the recycling of these, or, these Orientalist uh, mythologies around Islam uh, being a religion of submission, uh, you know, this idea of forced conversions, as well as this idea of Muslims being a monolith. So you have these sort of Orientalist uh, imaginaries and mythologies that still uh, persist in educational curricula within Quebec specifically. So having discussed Canadian Quebec society, looking at the different, uh, you know, the master scripts that we see in curriculum itself as well, I want to turn now to discuss the experiences of Muslims that, that work and, and attend these spaces of education. Um, so looking at the experiences of teachers, uh, Muslim teachers have described issues of bullying, that have come across both from uh, teachers, fellow colleagues, as well as students. This building comes off as associations with violence and terrorism, most typically, um, as well as collective blame when acts of violence are committed in the name of Islam. So whenever you have this sort of international instances, suppose there's a, a terrorist attack in Europe or something like that, by someone that's you know doing this violence in the name of Islam, there'll be this collective blame that will be pointed at towards uh, these educators. You know, why is it that your people do these things and, and so on? There's also this sense of othering that uh, teachers have been exposed to. You people need to change yourselves when you come to Canada. So this idea that you know they're not actually Canadian, but they're just outsiders. They're, they're these others that are coming here and contaminating this national space. In addition to experiencing racism and bullying themselves, uh, teachers have also been witnesses to racism and violence against Muslim students. So, so these educators are sort of on the front lines seeing how their own students are victims of bullying, uh, microaggressions, uh, racist teasing and taunting, 
as well as having you know hijabs pulled off and so on. So in, in occupying this space, not only do they have to manage the, the racism of their food that they're experiencing themselves, but they also have to take on this role of another mother or another parent, where they kind of are advocating on behalf of these marginalized and vulnerable uh, students that you know no, if they don't do then who will? Uh, which is not necessarily a position that they wanted to be in, but they found themselves having to, to advocate for these uh, for these individuals because if they didn't, no one else would. Looking at the experiences of Muslim students now, uh, Muslim students have also experienced bullying uh, from both teachers and uh, fellow colleagues. Bullying from teachers were often, especially for Muslim males, uh, was this association with violence and terrorism. Uh, you know, this came across through sort of uh, sanctioning and punishing uh, of, of Muslim students through, you know, uh, you know, if, if everybody would act up in class, uh, you know, the way that teachers would explain this would be because of their religious identity, you know. So if a Muslim boy was not paying attention in class, you know, so do you have headphones underneath that hijab? Uh, or if a Muslim boy was acting up in class, it'd be like, you know, or, you know, or if, if they're late to come to class, it's like, oh, it's because you were praying or something, that's why you're late to class. So often there's this sort of uh, bullying that's coming from teachers that's often associated with violence and terrorism, but also just the Muslim identity, more generally speaking. For Muslim students, um, you know, they, typically the way Muslims, uh, students experience racism from their, their colleagues is through microaggressions. So for Muslim male students, they, they typically were uh, teased, bullied, or, or harassed through microaggressions, associations with violence and terrorism uh, most often. Uh, Muslim women, however, it was slightly different. Um, for them, it was, it was interesting. They, they experienced these microaggressions was through excessive questions about stereotypes. Uh, so a lot of these individuals I spoke with, at some point they weren't wearing the hijab in schools and then they started wearing the hijab. And as soon as they kind of they, they became more visible in their, their Islamic identity, the questions came flooding in. Um, so you know they became these sort of insiders, whereas before they were kind of just taken for granted as normal students in the class. Now they became this sort of cultural other, uh, and they had inside information. So they were asked very stereotypical types of questions about you know, uh, uh, you know oppression, forced marriages, female genital mutilation, uh, things of that nature. Um, so some Muslim women that were kind of in those positions. Uh, they felt someone empowered to be in that position where they saw themselves as these gatekeepers of knowledge now. So they were able to sort of redefine the discourse on Islam because of you know being the source of of, of information now. They're able to re-educate people about Islam and, and re you know challenge those stereotypes around Islam and Muslims. Whereas other women uh, didn't want to be in that position. They didn't want to have that spotlight put on them. They didn't want that unnecessary attention. They didn't want to have to deal with the nonsense of these stereotypes. They just want to kind of live their lives in schools. So I'll, I'll start uh, my conclusion here uh, to, to round up. Uh, having coming back to to seeing, you know, to, to re looking at th these ideas of Islamophobia in educational spaces in Canada, uh, to me it's, it's it's very apparent that it's still a very so it's, it's traveling around a very sort of uh, tra volatile volatile trajectory. It's still very relevant in in, uh, in terms of research, in terms of actual you know things that are happening to some Muslim students in schools. Parts of Canada, particularly Quebec, are mirroring the extreme manifestations of systemic Islamophobia in that stripping away basic fundamental rights and freedoms of Muslims in educational spaces. Um, so, you know, we, we see these sort of extreme examples in places like France where there's a limiting of, uh, you know, Muslim agency, uh, Muslim practice in the public sphere. Now you're seeing that more and more specifically in Quebec where there's this limiting of, you know, uh, expressing yourself as a Muslim in terms of, of your identity if you're a Muslim teacher, but also just, the, you know, the practice of, of the religion, you know, uh, in prayer spaces and so on. State discourses surrounding Muslims have had a traumatic impact on Muslim students. You know, the, you know speaking to Muslim students from way back, uh, the state discourse really informed how they experience their, their everyday lives in these spaces. With the increase of these these types of measures, these systemic forms of, of bias and racism towards Muslims, uh, these uh, this can only, one can only assume that this will persist. This trauma will persist and even worsen over time. So moving forward, as a final thought, uh, you know, what is it that needs to be done moving forward? And these are just you know, my thoughts as an educator, someone that works as a, as a professor in a teacher's college now, you know, what is it that we should kind of move towards? There's a need for educators, both Muslims and allies, 
parents and students to push towards culturally responsive and sustaining forms of pedagogy in schools. Uh, ultimately, this is needed to be able to create spaces of resistance, as well as to preserve the dignity and rights of Muslim students. It's not just about promoting, you know, you know diversity and inclusion, but it's getting to a point where, you know, if these steps are not taken, uh, we'll see more and more stripping away of just basic rights and, and dignity of Muslim students. So this is, I think, the way forward. So uh, we'll end it there. Thank you so much for your attention and looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. the panel. Um, so in today's session, I will be um, discussing my findings from my PhD dissertation. So just give you the context of my um, PhD dissertation. Um, so Ontario um, contains the second highest proportions of uh, Muslim visible minorities, but yet um, there is a there is a lack of racial uh, diversification among teachers. So we already have established that Canada is quite is known as being diverse and inclusive, uh, but uh, but it continues to remain hidden uh, beneath a veneer of uh, multiculturalism. So we have uh, recently we have seen Islamophobic sentiments. It's been um, on the rise. Uh, just recently during the month of Ramadan, we have also experienced several hated, uh, motivated uh, incidents. So in 2019, uh, Quebec government has um, introduced a ban on religious garments uh, for, uh, for government employees that had direct um, consequences for teachers. And recently, uh, Quebec has also issued a directive designed to ban uh, pr uh, ban prayers in school. So educational institutions are not shielded from Islamophobic incidents. So Quebec's law on religious um, symbols is quite discriminatory and it has emboldened Islamophob uh, Islamophobes. So, so recently an associate teacher has justified failing a Muslim TC uh, just because she refused to take off her hijab. Um, so just the purpose of my study is to unveil the experience of 
experiences of a small, uh, small number of Muslim TCs enrolled in teacher education programs in Ontario. I've also recruited recent graduates. So it uncovers the increases, uh, intricacies of classroom inter, uh, interaction, um, instructor associate teacher student relationship, and Islamophobia. It also looks uh, examines the current program uh, a programmatic orientation and practices in teacher education programs. Um, given that I have only limited time, so I'm not going to go over the theoretical framework. I have utilized uh, the, the constructs of Islamophobia, re, uh, re, the racialization of religion, uh, the critical race theory, intersectionality. So I've uh, used a few tenets from CRT. For methodology, I have used um, a qualitative methods to examine experiences of Muslim TCs and recent graduates in three university-based Southern Ontario teacher education programs that differ demographically. So I've purposely uh, used a sample from white university-based teacher education program and my other two sites were selected from uh, BI programs that are situated in vibrant multicultural metropolises. Uh, so I've selected five, the aim was to select uh, five to seven participants uh, from each site. Uh, again, given that I don't have a lot of time here, um, so the first uh, theme reveals the impact of systemic practices of structural conditions of the teacher education programs. So I'm only going to uh, discuss religious practices, lack of accommodation. Uh, so this study confirms that Muslims' religious identity or practices of faith were inhibited by structural and cultural factors in the university context. So issues related to religious requirements were raised in all three institutions. So within these institutions, inadequate provisions for Muslim TCs have been identified, including insufficient provision, uh, a prayer, uh, so including ins insufficient prayer facilities, lack of access to a Muslim imam, the unavailability of halal food options, and disregarding for religious holidays. The participants were asked specifically to describe the attitude of faculty um, towards uh, religious accommodation. The, particip the participants have indicated that the faculty members were not receptive and were perceived as not so welcoming or inviting. Uh, consequences of this attitude is that some of the participants would refrain from requesting religious accommodations. And the other sh issue that was raised uh, was the rigidity of the BA programs uh, pro uh, schedule, which does not accommodate for religious diversity. So basically the religion, uh, the schedule does not mix faith or religion. So the current academic calendar clearly reflects the Christian Judeo calendar. Um, so also the strict policies surrounding the attendance further exacerbate, exacerbate the issue. So what it appears is that higher education institutions bear no specific accountability and they shift the onus um, or the responsibility on to, uh, to individuals. So basically the, on, uh, the onus is placed on individuals to access religious accommodation. So there was also um, a delicate negotiation involved um, as one of the by, as one of the participants has indicated that um, that preemptive planning was uh, was uh, required in order for her to avoid asking for religious accommodation um, the other issue is that there was no uh, that participants have mentioned that there was there are no designed area or designated area for praying and um, usually uh, the nursing or mindfulness room um, is usually used as a prayer room. Um, again, one of the participants, Saba, she described this as a tokenization. So they're like, here's your room. Um, just We're just checking off a box for us being uh, equitable. And the other issue that I wanted 
touch on the, is the practicum placement without consideration of TC's demographic. So a common thread that emerged across all participants, this happened particularly and predominantly white institution, is that is the issue of inappropriate and harmful placements, which can be seen as a manifestation of institutional barrier. Practicum in education programs are vital because majority of time time is, devo is devo uh, devoted towards um, practicum. So Muslim TCs have occurred uh, concerns regarding uh, ranging from being placed in a harmful uh, practicum sites to not being able to change the this, the practicum school when they when they request it. So placements in all white um, suburb schools uh, with exclusively white teachers compounded the feelings of exclusion and being an outsider. So the circumstances of some of the participants were acute uh, were, were acutely difficult. The problem of isolated uh, because there's only a small number of TCs enrolled in teacher education program. So when uh, students experienced these Islamophobic incidents, they were seen um, as isolated uh, circumstances. So the problem of these isolated Islamophobic acts is that it's difficult to eradicate since Muslim t uh, TCs do not have um, access to any uh, supportive institutional context. So concerns were not taken into account but uh, were only taken into account when they were uh, voiced with, fierce, uh, with fierceness. But whereas naming the problem often leads to becoming a problem, as the institutions have the tendency to block um, Islamophobic complaints, um, saturating this space. Even though uh, the TCs have reported uh, these incidents to the uh, to the faculty liaison, uh, which uh, are the practical supervisors, the support did not materialize because they did not know how to handle these uh, Islamophobic incidents. Um, so, so I'm mainly going to touch on the micro conditions, um, effective register of Islamophobic micro um, aggression. So these are just micro level experiences of TCs. The findings from analysis of participants' accounts suggest that the, most of the overt acts of Islamophobia occurred overwhelmingly in their practical placements rather than in their coursework um, within their respective of teacher education programs. A sign, again, a significant portion of teacher education is actually devoted towards the school placement. Uh, second, the reports of stereotype-based expectations were attributed to the experiences of uh, Muslims. Uh, the participants in this study experienced incidents where they were assumed to be as forever foreign, or the assumption that Muslims who were, uh, who were born and have lived in Canada for generations still possess innate connection uh, an affiliation to the um, countries of origin. So this, even though these comments may appear insignificant or harm, harmless, it still carries an undertone that Muslim Canadians are truly not Canadians. This statement implies that her students have not considered like someone like Maria, who is visibly Muslim, could become a teacher in the Canadian education system. And this, there's also tendency like to introduce yourself as a Canadian as this is an example of how individuals like white individual reaffirm difference and remind those of us who are constructed as other because we do not look Canadian of our outsider um, status. So furthermore, uh, Maria found herself, and this actually happened on her first day of practicum. She found herself in a position of not she didn't know how to respond or correct her AT because there is an imbalance of power between um, the practicum supervised, uh, sorry, um, associate teacher and the student. Assumptions of Muslim teachers and familiarity and illegitimacy are prevalent, were prevalent topic in my participants' narrative. Uh, this is an example of micro-invalidation. 
um, so excluding or nullifying the experiential knowledge. Uh, the participants have shared that the religion have played a role in the perception of the authority as a teacher candidate. Um, so usually these TCs are given a badge, but that uh, did not give them any authority. Uh, so there was a need to establish themselves as a credible and competent teacher and uh, educators, which is which uh, requires an added level of effort. Uh, so touching on the second quote here. <clears throat> Uh, so in high school setting, usually Islamophobia is intertwined with the discussion of world events and politics. Um, okay. Okay, so moving on to ostr uh, ostracizing Muslim TCs because they're perceived to be unqualified. I'm just going to skip this. So assumptions of homogeneity, Muslim TCs reported for being perceived as uh, displaying homophobic attitudes, exhibiting limited capacity to educate and provide support to K-12 students belonging to LGBTQ community. And they also demonstrated a devout adherence to Islamic faith. They were expected to serve uh, as an interlocutor on Islamic uh, theology. So one of the participants, Marwa, she was taking anti-oppressive uh, oppression course. Um, that was that discussed the um, topic of anti-homophobia education. Uh, education. So Marwa, she's an um, Asian convert. Uh, she struggled to reconcile her religious beliefs with homosexuality. So basically, when she uh, submitted her paper, uh, she was summoned by the office by the instructor. Uh, with the intention to report her to the head of the department and she was advised that her unconven unconventional um, point of her views may render her un unsuitable for teaching in public education system. So I'm just going to skip that too. <laughs> So participants reported that Islamophobic attitudes expressed by professors, which participants perceived to be detrimental to their um, education, to their academic experience. So Sarah has expressed concerns regarding a professor in faculty of education who purports to be an expert on Middle East, uh, on Middle East, and his behavior was deemed as cause for alarm. So this professor of Jewish descendant uh, has been observed of making insensitive jokes uh, about Muslim heritage and their religious ident uh, and their religious diet at, at, at times. And uh, he was exhibiting a patronizing de uh, demeanor. Uh, so he was insinuating that certain religion um, or certain groups are terrorists while others are not. So despite being a, mem uh, a member of minority religion, this professor passed as a way, and he felt he was entitled to make those derogatory jokes towards uh, Muslim uh, female students. And these m Muslim female students in a manner that intended to humiliate them, uh, whereas his um, he had, this professor had a friendly manner, a treatment towards the visibly Jewish um, students. So, am I out of time? Yeah, okay. So this professor has also, um, part of his uh, course uh, requirement was that the students uh, would per partake in this uh, discussion. So he would bring in um, guest speakers who had Islamophobic views. And I, he particularly brought this Imam, uh, known as Imam of Peace, who was not even qualified. Um, and he had Islamophobic uh, views. And just to wrap it up, um, so the interaction of participants, in, uh, participants encountered served to highlight the perceived otherness, and, and this, these can be conceptualized as microaggression. At times, words and, and words and microaggressive are subtle, but yet they are harmful because they'll happen over time. And so 
And the other thing I just want to touch is that um, a lot of these uh, Muslim student uh, TCs were not able to advocate given the, given the nature of the program. Um, again, there's imbalance of power between the TCs and the, and the associate teacher. So I'm just going to wrap it up here. I think I ran out of time. Thank you so much. and their really engaging um, talks that took us from looking at both memory and testimony and going from the politics of affect and memory and remembering and memorialization to the ways in which um, testimonies of Muslims who are involved in various kinds of systemic forms of oppression uh, are navigating and are um, curating and discussing those experiences so that we can better understand and think about ways to combat that. Um, I would like to now open up. We have some time for Q&A. So we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And so it's an opportunity for folks now who would like to ask questions of our panelists. Yes, go ahead. And I don't know if we have a microphone or maybe not. So you'll have to speak. I, I had a question for the president of the panel. So I, um, I come from France. Hi, Grace. Uh, uh, well, I'll get you the mic. Yeah. So uh, I had a question for the entire uh, panel. So uh, I come, I come from France and. Uh, in France, the uh, civil zones are submitted to specific legal status, uh, which is quite draconian. They are prohibited from expressing any political, philosophical, and emphasis religious views. And I wish to know if that was the case in Quebec or Canada. And if it's not the case, are you aware of any discourse which would lead to a transition? No. Thank you, thank you for the question. Um, so the way I look at Quebec is, uh, is, is France-like in many ways. It's basically one of the same patterns in Quebec. They, they define the ACT very similarly as well. And that's really what's kind of pushing uh, what's happening in France, as, as well as in Quebec specifically. Quebec is a bit more uh, I think, uh, extreme. The Islamophobia is more rampant there, it's more, it's more prevalent in terms of the societal sort of perception in a sense. So it's, it's going on the same trajectory. And I think in many ways, Quebec follows suit in what France does. Uh, whereas the rest of Canada looks at Quebec and I think they see like, okay, these places like the backwaters of Canada. Like, I think a lot of Canadians have this perception. Uh, being a former Quebec one myself, you know, like all the friends and family I have that are still there, they're like, they're seeing it more and more as if like, it's not the place that we grew up in and it's, it is changing its, its nature. The only concern, the main concern I have about this is that, you know, uh, Things change really fast, and so if in a place in if a place in Canada is adopting these sort of ideas and measures, you know it's not it's not inconceivable that these things can can, can be pushed further uh, further west in different places and spaces within Canada. That's really where the, the concern comes. Um, so yeah, I, I think that in terms of we're not there yet, and I, I don't see us being there anytime soon. But uh, I think now is the time more than ever to kind of produce knowledge on this topic context and to push back against it because if it's, it's, if it's passive, things change pretty fast. Uh, uh, but your question was whether in fact uh, politicians, public speaker, uh, public persona can articulate civil servants. Civil servants. Yes, they can. And that's one of the dangers is that not only really is it sanctioned, and legitimized, but it's very easy. And we have a premier who basically says that systemic Islamophobia doesn't exist. Islamophobia doesn't exist. Systemic racism doesn't exist. So that kind of sort of turns it around. And the, the, much like I would say the rest of Canada, which has a cultural life racism, the same thing with Quebec. 
it's like, well, they're not like us, you know, and of course they come from previously colonized places, right? So that puts in another la layer, another dynamic of inferiorization uh, that is ongoing, but it's culturalized, and and that's what, what happens. But they are, yeah, they have carte blanche. Thank you. Uh, Jean Pierre Bourdieu, Paris, for the great papers, um, and I have one specific question for you, Yasmin, which is, um, I was very struck by this image that you showed of the Hello Brother. And I was wondering, because for me, when I saw it, it kind of represented a, a way of some ambivalence. Um, on the one hand, you were discussing it um, at the backdrop of resistance, but at the very same time, you know, it symbolizes something of um, a very welcoming nature of most religious folks who would even call somebody a brother who would turn out to become their murderer. So I was just wondering, like, what kind of discourse there existed around those kinds of images, and also what does that make within the Muslim community that was locally affected and if there was a discussion, and if so, then what kind of discussion emerged out of or around these images? I can't, I can't really speak to the specifics of that because uh, this was actually from a paper that my colleague uh, Anu Harju has written with a team where they were actually canvassing and, and they had a, a, a real time collection of the data that was coming out of New Zealand at that time. So minutes, they, they, they had people sort of staying up all night collecting this stuff. So what was interesting to me, it's like, you know how they had just me, Charlie, and then they had just me, Ahmed. Um, so it's a way in which these sort of symbolic um, artifacts can take on something. And I think in the, in the case of Christchurch, one of the things was it was, it really, really uh, resonated and emphasized the innocence of the victims there, that they were so unaware and so um, so welcoming of people who would come in without even thinking that this person is going to shoot them. So I think it, it, it played on them in the, the register, the emotive register was, wow, I just as we felt when we, we saw it, it was like, oh my God, you know, not even knowing that this guy is going to turn the gun on you. So uh, it evoked that, and I think that's what also allowed it to travel so much. So much so that it became like a, that it generated, I think, also a kind of response from others, from the non-Muslims, to say, look, to see the horror of it. But again, you know, when you see the horror of it, you think, well, this is a one-off time. Uh, a crazy man has gone over there, rather than seeing it as part of a systemic Uh, thank you all so much for your presentations. This question is perhaps uh, particularly for Dr. Bakali, but anyone who might have insight on this is uh, free to answer. I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more about Bill 21 and the implications of that. I was particularly curious about what that means for enforcement, whether it's teachers then who are charged with enforcing a uh, ban on religious uh, dress, um, what that means for Muslim teachers in particular, but teachers in general, and kind of how this fits into questions about the broader landscape of policing and securitization of schools and, and the policing of Muslim youth. Thank you so much for the question. So Bill 21 was, is, a, is a second iteration. This was actually uh, a by a different political party in the, uh, 2016. Uh, the BQ government had proposed this and didn't pass through not because they didn't have popular support, but because uh, they started to promote rhetoric on our separation, and so that party didn't get you know, re-elected, and so that got kind of shelved for a while. But then the current government, I think in 2019, they were the past uh, Bill 21. Um, now, so this bill, uh, it's, it's, I think for anyone that's in a position of authority, that still helps me. So anyone that's deemed to be in a position of authority within a public institution is not allowed to wear a religious symbol. So this expands beyond school space, but also more systemically, like in law enforcement, uh, you know, in, in, in law and other places as well. Uh, and the, the actual implications of this is that people have chosen to 
be their jobs. And in terms of education, I can tell you firsthand, I know people that literally, uh, even in the, so you have the French school boards and the English school boards. The French school boards are a little bit more, you know, more I think, militant with these things, but even the English school boards that were generally kind of, you know, uh, evolved from the Protestant system, which is more tolerant towards differences, even within those spaces, they're, they're, they're implementing stuff. And so teachers have, on the grounds of principles, have left their positions. And some are kind of, kind of forced to change their religion or their their, uh, their, their jobs. So it, it has literally has an effect on people in their job. Some teachers have been able to work around this and clean up other positions within schools uh, as, as opposed to just teaching. But again, they're forced to kind of uh, acquiesce to this, this, this law. So it's, it's very practically speaking, it's, it's forced people out of the system. And as an educator, I can tell you that representation is so unbelievably important. If you have a lack of representation, all these students that are experiencing bullying and some bullying and so on, they have no they have no recourse, they have no to go for anymore, right? So this has a massive long term effect. And like I said earlier, you know, this, this sort of trauma that you see among students because of the public discourse is only going towards a more you know, uh, steeper trajectory. At this point. So it, it, this has very very practical implications. But if I can add something to that, one of the things that's just come up now is in fact uh, um, the denial of any kind of a public space for praying within schools, with the uh, onus then placed on other students to police Muslim students and to to basically say who's who's the one that's going out to pray. So there is another system that's going on as well, and. You can see every which way it's it's a way to sort of squeeze them out, and of course you know the rationale is that Quebec, because of its history with the church, which was incredibly oppressive, uh, so much so I mean we've had stories of women who died in childbirth because the church refused to um, have them uh, allow them to practice contraception. So there's such a strong um, animosity to the church. Anything speaking of religion is like out. Uh, thank you all for uh, your presentation. I, uh, I join you in, in highlighting the not such a great white north. Um, so that was very helpful. Um, I just wanted to lift up um, Dr. Jawani, you know, just taking us through some of the memory work and showing how, um, you know, it, you mentioned, um, you know, that this, these are kind of tactical forms of resistance, and you know that was very productive because the digital space is obviously a place of also desecration, right? So it's, it's it's important to see these images being used outside of desecration and also as forms of resistance. So I want to thank you for lifting that up. Um, I seen I just uh, want to congratulate you as a doctoral team. I guess in, in terms of your work, it's not going to be able to. So that's, that's really great. And then the question for um, Dr. Hawk is, um, again, also thanking, thanking you for uh, taking us through this work of mourning. And, and, um, you know, so one of the things that we constantly have heard is, you know, first, before you start any work in Islamophobia studies, you denounce terrorism. You have to go through these scripts, right? So in your work, I'm wondering if there's been any response um, to first not denouncing honor killings, um, you know, as a, as a first step towards being able to say all the other things that you were saying, right? And, and I know you ended your presentation with the family and how it created this, you know, tombstone and then remembered them uh, up so, but um, I wonder if that's come up with your work. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. You know, this idea, so when I say honor buildings, I normally say in quotation marks. Um, it is important to understand the role of honor in femicide in different parts of the world as well. Um, you know, Nina Jamal and folks like that have written about uh, understanding different kinds of contexts, religious, cultural, and otherwise. In, so, that you know, it's not just honor is not anything, but honor can be one of the justifications for killing. But in the Canadian, in the kind of multicultural white settler context, 
it gets used as the idea of the limit case of tolerance in these contexts, right? Like, we welcome all cultures, we welcome all kinds of practices, but this is the limit case. This is the form of femicide that is extracted. You know, Canada has incredibly high rates of uh, domestic violence and femicide. These are sort of separated out um, that kind of consideration and that kind of analysis. So when I have presented my work, particularly at the beginning, because as I said, I've written about this case. This is my third paper. Um, and I was asked to write the first paper, actually, through our Heritage Canada grant. Um, and when I presented that work, I really uh, had to do, I realized, oh, wow, People need to hear all kinds of that framing, disavowal, and you know, careful checking kind of work. Um, I think as issues around Islamophobia and the sort of systemic way this is baked into white settler ideas of what is a multicultural society, a bit critique or more like you know, the great work of Jasmine, Jasmine. Um, there's often less push, but it's there, definitely, um, and I'm very mindful of it. So I do have you know, lots of footnotes to take on the paper to kind of address that. I think the last question. Thank you for your uh, for your uh, papers, it was really interesting and wonderful. Um, I'm fascinated by your um, concept of memory, um, specifically um, the idea of recovering historical memory for liberation psychology is really relevant to it. Um, one of the things that I'm wondering is how has your work been received by the Muslim community? Um, particularly because I think one of the critiques of um, critical race theory in the U.S. Is, is that we're trying to change tradition. Um, and I think there's an interesting tension between our emphasis as Muslims on tradition and our tradition, and us kind of um, navigating that tension with um, kind of hegemonic white culture and that tradition. I'm curious if there's been a lot of self-reflection or comments about from the Muslim community about what it's like for us to assert our tradition in the face of their tradition, and what those memories are like in dialogue. Uh, as, what, what is the response to your work been like in the Muslim community so in relation to that question? I don't think um, there's been like a, a formal response as such. I think most of the time it's like, how do we, how do we actually uh, use Grief, just as how, how do we actually use our pain to make our realities palpable and expressible to, to everyone? When I think about, and I think, I mean, my uh, Zainab Faruqi is actually going to be talking about some of those uh, testimonies that were uh, posted on, our, on one particular website uh, rounding up Sol Salman and murders. It's there is such a strong, strong uh, negation of our, our of our realities. There's such a strong negation of Islamophobia in Canada. You know, it's like what Jasmine was saying, how she was asked about is there Islamophobia. There is such a strong denial. And I think that in the face of that denial, it becomes imperative to, to talk back. You know, if I were to use Bell Hooks' terms. And these forms become ways of talking back. So, but in that talking back, they also become, uh, they become vehicles for political organizing, which is really important because when I think back to the, uh, to the murder of the 15 women at the L'Ecole Polytechnique, you know, in 1989, it took more than 10 years to get them a memorial. And I think about the Muslim community and how much this kind of mobilization has actually within three years we actually did get a day recognized. Yeah. And that is like phenomenal. So I think that it's it, it gives us a kind of affirmation of that reality and allows us to continue. 
But the other thing, too, is that just as, you know, Dr. Jiva had said, it's like these spaces can be sites of de desecration. But the enclaves that are possible in the digital world where we create counter spheres are places also of affirmation. It's places where we hear each other's stories and that we gatekeep in terms of allowing others in. So in that way, they are sort of like memory communities that are online. And I think they're very powerful that way. Having said that, I'm going to turn it to Eve, who's going to show you the other side of it. Okay. <laughs> um, I didn't, so I wanted to say that um, I didn't have time to cover, as I do in the paper, all the different ways uh, in which the Muslim community, and I want to say that's a better, very heterogeneous community in Canada, you know. Um, so one, one really interesting example is in the after access deaths, young Muslim women, um, they, they started a zine called Access Zine. And it's a zine that's open to all young Muslim women, when women identify trans, queer, otherwise, to share their experiences of Islamophobia and anti Muslim racism. Um, you know, from schools, on work sites, on all aspects of their life. So, uh, you know, at that time, because it was 2007, this was actually a physical zine, but now it exists online. It's been archived online. So, again, digital spaces. But if you go onto YouTube, uh, access Facebook page, all these places became sites of warning, remembrance, engagement by other Muslim Muslims, you know, uh, in that sort of very heterogeneously understood uh, what is a Muslim community. So I think that's really important to um, understand in the Canadian context, right? There is no one Muslim response to these memorialization, memorialization and memory practices, right? Um, and also it can work the other way. I didn't get a chance to mention this, but um, the money that was raised, $5,000, it never, uh, the Sharon Cook wouldn't accept it because of that publicity that came out about, you know, being affiliated with Pam Yeller and Rob Spencer and she had watch and so on. So they still had the $5,000 and then they had been disavowed ultimately, you know, a year later by the town that this memorial, you know, we love Aksa, we want to remember her, but this has nothing to do with this Islamophobia industry, mm -hmm. uh, equal Islamophobia industry. So left with the $5,000, Pat Geller and Robert Spencer approached the Jewish National Fund and they uh, put up a plaque in Jerusalem at the American Independence Park in her name and they planted a grove of trees in her name. And you can see on YouTube, a kind of memorial that they put up as they um, memorial, you know, as they install this plaque and the speeches that Pam and Robert give the utter Islamophobic exploitation of AXA and other women's lives um, in this kind of what they would were calling a memorial practice, right? So, how is that then taken up, right, by other? Muslim and wider communities is also something to think about. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, everyone. And thanks to this stellar panel and the wonderful papers, I'm going to just close with one thought here. I had a conversation recently with some colleagues about how about the empathy gap when it comes to addressing Islamophobia. Um, you know, there's often a sense that there is no empathy around this, that people are not, you know, despite the facts, despite all of the, you know, evidence of Islamophobia and difference within various nations, there seems to be a gap there when it comes to people empathizing with this form of oppression. Um, and if we're talking about it from the perspective of methodology, you know, it's not, while well, data and information, quantitative information is important, it doesn't fill that gap. You know, it's the storytelling that fills that gap. And so I think that this is something that we've gotten from each of the participants today and the work that they're doing is those um, curating real stories, whether it's the experiences of Muslim students and teacher candidates, 
or the <coughs> stories that we bring up of Aksa and what happened after her death and how we saw the food industry came in to manipulate that, or you know, the memorialization of um, those who have died tragically in Canada as a result of terror attacks. I think hearing these stories through this lens that our panelists <coughs> have helps us get closer to um, addressing that. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much. I uh, appreciate everyone's attention. Uh, <laughs> So thank you. We're going to be on break from now until 3 p.m. Uh, for those who want to observe Friday prayer, the Friday prayer is being held at the Berkeley Mosque. Uh, the students' MSA is not doing a Friday prayer on campus because uh, this is r, &R week and the finals week. So there is the uh, Friday prayers will be at the Berkeley Mosque. So for people who want to walk there, we could gather and it will be a walk to the Berkeley Mosque. Thank you. So three o'clock back in here.